Thank you, Dr. Fajardo, for the amazing lecture. I'd like to invite the second speaker. Dana, Dana McGregor is a wide molecular biologist at the Rothenstead Research, working with the weed Allopecorus misoride, that is the most problematic weed in UK. Her uh, scientific interest is in understanding how weed management induces molecular changes that result in the development outputs that allow the plant to survive, mainly to herbicides. Please, Dr. Dana. There we go. Okay. Um, I'd like to start off by saying that I've changed my title. So I apologize if you're only here to hear about RNAi, but I'll get there eventually. Please be patient with me. But what I decided to do is rather than talk to you about one specific technology, I wanted to talk to you more about the types of technologies that I and my collaborators at Rothamsted are using to try and both understand and manipulate blackgrass. So thank you to the organizers, and I appreciate you putting up with my change of title, and hopefully it'll be worth it. Um, so just to start off, I also wanted to thank the organizers for inviting me to Brazil uh, to be able to eat your food. This has been fantastic. Thank you. I, I love food. And whether it's food from where I'm from or where I live in England or fabulous things that I've been able to eat while I'm here, uh, I, I really am driven by food. And this is really my motivation to getting into uh, weed science. And I'll tell you more about that in a second. But um, I'm not the only person in the world who likes food. There's quite a lot of us. And in, basically, by 2050, there's going to be 9.5 billion people on the Earth. And that's quite a lot of people to, um, to give Goyabara to. So hopefully, you know, but, um, and as, as Keith went through this morning, we've got um, quite a lot of improvement that we need to do in order to create enough food for all of these people to eat. So the current projections are that we are not going to make enough food in order to feed everybody. So really, the challenge of scientists is to try and figure out how we can make these improvements and how we can use the technology that we have and develop new technology in order to meet these gaps. And really, at the moment, um, we can't exactly just move out into new land because of the hospitable land that we have, quite a lot of it, already 50% of it, is actually already devoted to agriculture. So we can't really just go out and make new land to make more food. And this is even worse in England, where actually 70% of our land is already devoted to agriculture. So these increases in, in, in food production need to be done by making more efficient and effective use of the land that we already have. And at the moment, the three things that are, that are most uh, problematic for being efficient and effective of production are these guys. So we've got pests, weeds, oh sorry, pests, weeds, and diseases. And these things really contribute greatly to the reduction in our yields. And of those, of course, I think weeds are the most important, but here's some data that, that back that up. This is a recent study that was done in India, and they calculated that actually a third of their yield losses was directly attributable to weeds. And it's not just yield losses, but it's huge amounts of money that are being, uh, being economic costs due to weeds. So this is nearly uh, 11,000 um, million US dollars that's directly attributed to weeds. So that's quite a big problem. So to try and deal with weeds, we as humans have come up with a lot of different ways to kill them. So there's a lot of different herbicides that are, that are, that are able to be used on weeds. And many of them are, are currently, sorry, you can't see any of these names, but, um, but hopefully this is a sort of a familiar slide to most of you. Um, and these, weed, these herbicides have been used in vast quantities. So it doesn't matter if you're in the UK or if you're in Brazil, we're putting hundreds of thousands of tons of herbicides every year onto, onto our, our land to try and kill these weeds. Um, and and this, this, it was nice to see that the data this morning that indicated that this, this might be dropping, but I think that it's, it's fair to say that herbicides are, are, are out there uh, and they're being used in huge amounts. However, weeds are smart. Uh, weeds are wicked smart, actually. And they've, they've evolved a number of different ways to, to avoid death by herbicides. And you can see that as you go along time, this is time along the bottom, and number of unique cases of herbicide-resistant weeds globally, plants are starting to survive these herbicide treatments and understand how ways to, to avoid being killed. Uh, and and herbicide resistance is really a global problem. Uh, so in the UK, we have 28 unique cases of herbicide resistance reported. And in Brazil, your number is about 48. So there's, um, glo globally, herbicide resistance is really a problem. And if you look at the top 10 list of herbicide-resistant species, there's lots of uh, very familiar names on there, I'm sure. 
But in the UK, we kind of only have one weed that we deal with, and this is Elipocursus myrosides. And this is, uh, as a weed scientist, our favorite weed. As a, 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 as a agronomist or a, a farmer, it's your least favorite weed. Uh, and this weed is, 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 um, has lots of different um, sites of action, and it's, it's, um, I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking about Elipocursus myrosides, or blackgrass. So um, blackgrass is a serious problem in the UK. These red and or orange and or yellow dots are where it's located. Uh, so it goes from all the way from northern Scotland all the way down to southern Cornwall. And you can see that the uh, change in color is indicating that this, this weed is, is starting to spread out more and more. Um, this really nicely overlaps with the distribution of wheat cropping that we have in the UK. You can see that the colors are nicely overlapping. And the, the sad thing is that um, in every case where, in, where there's a county that has, a, a, um, a, or, that has black grass, there are reported cases of it being herbicide resistant as well. So really it is that herbicide resistant black grass is a serious problem in the UK. And it's not just in the UK, it's not just our problem, which is a nice thing to share. Um, but it's also all across sort of Western Europe as well. Uh, you can see from sort of the, the late 1970s onwards, there's various cases that have been, have been reported of herbicide resistance cropping up in this weed, uh, and it's spreading out really nicely uh, from uh, sort of central Western European countries. Um, and it's, I figured many of you have never actually seen black grass or even thought about it, so this is the beast. Uh, it's actually a relatively pretty plant. It's a grass weed that grows in and amongst grass crops. It creates lots and lots and lots of seeds. So here it is growing, this is the, uh, the crop there and there's the weed. Uh, and what it does is it grows out and it pops its heads up above the, the wheat, the, um, either the barley or the wheat for the most part. And it's a, an obligate outcrosser, so it creates tons and tons of pollen, which then goes and mixes and you end up with a really nice heterogeneous population within a population. Uh, and as you can see from this picture of a, a plant that I've grown in the glass house, it creates tons of heads per per plant. You can have, have up to 100 heads per plant, and each of these heads produces about 100 seeds. So that's a huge problem that can grow exponentially from year on year. Uh, and the biggest problem, not for me, but for farmers, is that this plant actually creates a, a serious problem for yields. So uh, you can see nicely there's a, the crop yield here on the y-axis and the, the black grass along the x. And you can see a, a, a clear linear decrease in the amount of yield that happens per black grass head. Uh, so, uh, to get more food, uh, more bread, more cake, in my case, a uh, really easy way to do that is by decreasing the number of black grass. So, when you're talking about impact, uh, a big change from here to here happens in the, in the field. Um, black grass actually isn't only a weed. It does grow wild out throughout the world. Um, it's, all of these dots are places where it's been reported, uh, and most of these places, um, people don't even know that it exists. It does have lots and lots of different names, so I figured I'd put this up. Maybe one of these might be familiar to you. Um, but as I said earlier, uh, really it is only in these Western European countries where black grass has become herbicide resistant. And part of the problem, or part of the reason why black grass has only become herbicide resistant in those is because it's very, oops, missing some bits. Um, it's perfectly suited to Western European agriculture. So I figured I'd put this up. Let's see if I can get this to come up again. Nope. Okay, so there's a time frame up here, and basically this is uh, a winter sowing, so this would be October, and over here is August. And so we put the seeds in, and then the, the, um, the wheat grows along through the time, it over, over, um, over winters as, a, as, as basically a rosette. Uh, and black grass actually emerges at the same time or after we've put the, um, the wheat seeds into the ground. So it's coming up after the crop is in the ground, and you can see it here. So this is the wheat, and here's the little weeds. Uh, and the time frames are, are along here. And it also sheds its seeds completely by, before the crop is taken out. So it's a very clever beast in that it has its entire life cycle that happens within the cropping cycle. This means that, huh, missing another bit, that's okay. Um, it means that all of the seeds are actually dropped by the time the uh, harvest happens. And so any of these that are herbicide resistant, they then come back the next year and they create more and it's a vicious cycle. So really the, the life cycle of, of blackgrass is perfectly suited to Western European agriculture. And it means that there's, there's this continued um, replenishment of the soil seed bank. So hopefully I've convinced you relatively quickly that this is a very cunning weed 
and all of the ways that we have to deal with, uh, the regular ways that we have to deal with weeds, are, it actually completely circumvents. So it's a grass weed that grows in grass crops. It's very good even in our most competitive crops. The entire life cycle happens within the cropping cycle, so this, the seeds are, are constantly replenishing. And it's also um, herbicide resistant. I'll talk to you more about the herbicide resistance in a second. But um, in general, the blackgrass biology makes it really, really difficult to, to control. Uh, and so basically, what, what we are trying to do is trying to figure out what's enabled it and does enable it to become such a good weed. Okay? So there's not really much that we can understand about the physiological methods. So it's a grass weed that grows in grass crops. Not much I could change about that. That would be nice if I could completely alter its physiology, but there's no way for that. But we can also we can start to think about different biological methods, cultural methods, or chemical methods that we can that we can circumvent in order to make this a less problematic weed. So, <laughs> in the art of war, it's said uh, to, to if you know your enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. And I showed you all of the places in England where this is growing, and we have far more than 100 battles that we're fight facing every single year. And so what we are trying to do is we are, we are trying to know the enemy. And this is our enemy, in short. So back in 2014, before I joined Rothamsted, there was the Blackgrass, Research, uh, Blackgrass Resistance Initiative that was, in, that was set up with colleagues of mine at Rothamsted, as well as some other universities and, and, and research organizations across the UK. And what they did was they went out into 132 different pop field populations across the, the, the region where blackgrass really is centered, which again, just to remind you, is, is really where wheat is being grown. And they chose these fields uh, based on a variety of different things, uh, including having farmers who were willing to work with us. And what they did is they went out into, into the fields and they measured a variety of different things. So firstly, quite a lot of ground truthing. Um, we went and walked trend lines to figure out what's the abundance that's there, how much black grass is there, where is it, how deep is it, that sort of thing. Uh, and then we brought back seeds and tested things like resistance phenotypes, target site, non-target sites, quantifications. And very importantly, um, also went and worked with the farmers to get the management histories. So each of these fields can be thought of as a little tiny experiment that every farmer has done something slightly different in order to lead to that particular population of black grass that is there. And so by understanding what happened in the past, we can try and figure out what retrospectively how we got to where we were. So this, um, this BGRI has given us a huge amount of information. And as I said, some of this is about, multiple, about herbicide resistance. And one of the clear patterns that comes out here is that blackgrass has um, multiple herbicide resistance, and the herbicide resistance is extremely widespread in England. So we brought these seeds back into the lab and tested three different, uh, three different types of um, two. So mesosulfuron, which is an ALS, uh, ACCase, phenoxyprop, and ACCase cycloxidim. And the way to read this is that the more red, the less dead. So what you can see is that across the, the, the map, there's very few blue dots at all. Uh, and if you look at the sort of the accumulative data, most of the populations that we brought back were not only resistant to one, but two and three different modes of action. So this, this indicates that the, the herbicide resistance is, is present and it's very prevalent, and it's also multiple herbicide resistance is very widespread. So as, as you're all, I'm sure, aware, uh, herbicide resistance is made up of two components. So on one side, there's target site resistance. And this is where usually there's a single change in the amino acid sequence of the target site. So the thing with which the herbicide is interacting in the plant that leads to plant death. So target site resistance provides specific resistance to a single mode of action. It's often caused by a single point mutation. And, and there are many different target site mutations that have been found in, in black grasses, um, two key targets, the ALS and the ACCA gene. So on the other hand, you have non-target site resistance. Um, I find this to be a much more interesting mode of resistance because it's not a, a change in the protein itself that the, the herbicide is interacting with, but something else in the plant that's allowing it to survive. So this provides unpredictable resistance both within and between modes of action, and um, usually what's, it's typified by rapid metabolism of the target itself. So this is the herbicide molecule itself is being changed by the plant so that the plant can survive it. There's many different genes and proteins that have Im been implicated, uh, and I'm gonna ask you to remember just one protein name. So that's it, so you can relax. 
Um, but this, this protein that I'd like you to remember is AMGSTF1, and this is a phi-class glutathione transferase. And I'll come back to this one again later. So there's these two types of, of, of resistances that, are, that can occur in, um, in, in plants. And so which one does blackgrass have? Well, so we can, because the target site resistance is just a sequencing uh, method, and we can go and sequence all of the genes in, in the blackgrass, uh, sorry, in the, in the targets. And what, what was found was that the, um, of the plants that were tested, about 50% of them contained at least one mutation in a target. So that's a huge proportion, but it wasn't equally distributed over our populations. You can see the different pie graphs show different mutations, different colors along the thing, where um, the wild type is here in white, and any bit of color is a single mutation. So in black grass, uh, there's a 197 mutation that comes up in ALS, and there's a 1781 that comes up in the ACCS, and these are relatively widespread. So this just is a pattern of what's happening out there, but it also allows us to then understand better what the mechanisms that are going on. And um, target site resistance, it turns out, isn't the whole picture. So target site mutations cannot fully explain the phenotypes that we saw. And the way that I can say this is because we know the phenotypes of these plants, and if we map the proportion of the plants that contain a target site resistant versus those that are surviving the, herb the herbicide, what you see is a pattern like this. So on the far left, here's the data for cycloxidim, and there's a really nice one-to-one -one correlation between the proportion of plants that are surviving versus those that have the, the, the um, target site resistance. And so what this means is that the phenotype that we're observing for cycloxidim can be perfectly explained by the presence or absence of the target site mutation. Okay? But for, no, for phenoxaprop and mesosulfuron, uh, there's many more plants that are surviving compared to what ought to be on this one-to-one -one correlation. And so this means that something else is also still at play. Okay. So I said that it's these two parts. I asked you to remember one protein name, and this was AMGSTF1. And the reason that I asked you to remember that is because the concentration of this protein in a plant is really um, directly correlated to the level of resistance that you're seeing in the plant for non-target site resistance. So this is kind of a diagnostic for whether or not, for the level of non-target site resistance that's present in the plant. So plants that have high levels of non-target site resistance have high amounts of this protein, and plants that are resist uh, sensitive and therefore have low non-target site resistance have low levels of the protein. Okay? So we can actually go and measure the amount of this protein, and what we see here is just to ma map that back on to the maps that I showed you before. We know the, the level of resistance, the, the proportion of the plants that are surviving the herbicide, and now we can map on the concentration. And yet again, so there's, there's some correlation. There's definitely some indication that there's, there's a correlation between the amount of the protein that's happening and the survival. Uh, just to remind you, this one was uh, non-target, this one was target site resistance, so you can ignore that one for the moment being. Um, but so there's definitely an indication that tar non-target site resistance is in conferring some of this phenotype, but it's not the whole story, because if you look at any one concentration of the AMGSTF1, so any one level of non-target site resistance, uh, there's quite a huge range of phenotype that could be happening. So clearly there's something else that needs to be happening in, in the plant, and there's some other mechanisms that are at play other than just this one protein and the target site resistance. So this is where I come in, and um, I'm not really a weed scientist. I'm very much a molecular biologist, a molecular geneticist, and so I think about things in a slightly different way. Um, much of my past life has been in asking this question, so how do plants survive environmental challenges? Um, I happen to be on the plant side, when if you're taking sides for either dead or not dead, I'd like them to live. I think it's very interesting that these plants can survive herbicides and that they've found mechanisms to, to so how, the, how it works. And much of my past work has been with Arabidopsis. And uh, the questions that I've been asking are things like, if you have an environmental output in, input that leads to some sort of developmental output, what are the genes and molecules that allow that to happen? So what are the molecular responses that, that take this information and turn it into a thing? Uh, and so for me, when I moved into weed science, I kind of wanted to do all the things that I used to be able to do in Arabidopsis in, in blackgrass. And so I, I kind of feel like I can just take all of this information and convert it from the environmental input to an agri-environmental challenge, and survival is now my developmental output. So basically, I'm trying to figure out what are the molecular responses that allow blackgrass to survive all of the challenges that we put at it. Because weeds, by definition, 
are plants that, despite our very best efforts to kill them, survive. So really, what I'm trying to do is trying to get a molecular understanding of how black grass is surviving in, its, in the environment. Okay? And I'm doing this in two different approaches. Uh, and I'm taking two separate aspects of, of this apart. So really, one is, is trying to find new genes that are underpinning this survival, and the other is really testing di hypotheses directly in black grass. So I'm doing some genetics and genomics, comparative genom transcriptomics, and then trying to ask questions about necessity and sufficiency. And so for the rest of my time, I'm going to talk you through these different steps and, and, and tell you about the data that we're getting and how the approaches that we're taking. So eventually, I will get to RNAi, I promise. But first, I'll talk to you about genetics and genomics. Um, so I'm very happy to be able to say that we at Rothamsted, in collaboration with people at Bayer and at Clemson University, are um, annotating and sequencing the first black grass genome. So this is very exciting because for the first time, it will allow us really to climb inside the genome and ask questions uh, about how it's doing the things that it's doing. So having a genome can't be underestimated um, because actually, Weed genomics really is an emerging field. We heard a little bit about that this morning. Uh, and I've put some uh, names of genes, of uh, names of species that have been, been sequenced and the level that they've been sequenced to. Uh, the references I can send to people if they want. Sorry, they're not showing up particularly well. But um, mostly what you can see is that none of these are really pre-2016. Uh, and there is this really nice website uh, for weedgenomics.com that will allow you to search whether or not your, your weed of interest is, is available and interested. But really, um, the level of detail that's here is nothing like the level of detail that we have for crops. Uh, so my hope is that one day, we'll be able to climb inside the genomes of weeds like we do for the, for the other crops and for the other species out there. And this is really necessary for black grass because at the moment, this is what we know. This is the only picture that we can put up about the black grass genome. Uh, which is basically that there are seven chromosomes. It's diploid, which is great. And yes, this was done in 1944, so we've got some time to catch up uh, on what's going on. But, but at the moment, with the genome, we could do things like figure out what's actually there. What are the genes that are present? Also, uh, we can start to look for differences in the genome between the herbicide-resistant and the herbicide-sensitive plants. And we can start to figure out what's the structure. So by understanding heterochromatic versus euchromatic versus methylated versus all of these epigenetic treatments that happen on top of the DNA sequence, we can start to look at the structure of, of the genome itself. By understanding the structure, then we can start to figure out the function, because really DNA is just the means by which proteins are made. And so we can start to investigate how are things made, what's the process by which they're made, is it accessible, is it not? And remember, we have huge amounts of natural variation for black grass. Even amongst our 132 populations, we've got lots of different independent experiments that have been happening through time to create these natural variations that we can then start to investigate. So the genome itself is going to be incredibly enabling. And from there, I wanted to move over into transcriptomics. I talked about the function, uh, and really because DNA is just there to make stuff. So um, one of the things that uh, we've recently done is to look at the transcriptomes for 10 of our field collected populations and six really archetype standards. So we've got sensitive ones, we've got ones that are archetyped non-target site resistance for the two different methods. Uh, we've got one that's just a pure target site resistance. So some archetype standards as well as 10 of our populations. And remember for these populations, we have exquisite detail about where they're from, how much was there, what, what, what's their history and that sort of thing. I'm not going to talk to you too much about these details, partly because they're new, but also because uh, it's th this sort of a picture, right, that you're getting out of transcriptomics. So the nice thing about transcriptomics is it gives you broad-scale detail as well as tiny-scale detail. So I can then find out that this gene is overrepresented in the resistant population compared to the sensitive one. But also I can talk to you about all of these genes are overrepresented. So I can start to look at pathways and processes that are involved, not just specific genes. So these blobograms um, really are just kind of giving you a general scale, what's up and what's down regulated. The nice thing about this is this blob here is actually glutathione metabolism. And remember the one gene was GSTF1. So this is involved in glutathione synthesis transferase. So it's very nice that the things that ought to be coming up are. So now that we know that the experiment has kind of worked, we can then start to investigate what are these other blobs? What are the genes that are involved there? Can we come up with entire new processes that are involved in herbicide resistance that we never thought to look at before? 
These are the unknown knowns, so things that might be involved that we've never considered. Uh, so I'm going to move away from transcriptomics because, uh, again, going through the individual genes would, uh, would not be any fun for anybody. So instead, I wanted to just give you a broad-scale picture of the type of stuff that's coming out of transcriptomics. But the nice thing about both the transcriptomics and the, and the genomics is that it raises more questions than it doesn't. So every time you get an answer, there's a, there's a whole series of new questions that comes out. And so what I've been doing um, most of my time at Rothamsted has actually been in designing hypothesis testing and means by which to ask questions specifically in blackgrass. So rather than trying to do this in, in moving it to a new species and asking it in a rabbitopsis, does it do this? I want to be able to ask the questions directly in blackgrass. Because in uh, model systems, um, we can do things like this. So model systems must be experimentally tractable. They have well-characterized natural populations. They must be amenable to experimental manipulation, and you must have access to omics and the ability to do genetic manipulation. So, so far in my talk, hopefully I've convinced you that we have these things for, for black grass, uh, and I've shown you some examples of those. And so for the very last bit of my talk, if I'm okay on time, yeah, great. Excellent, so I'm gonna talk to you about the, the means by which I'm doing genetic manipulation of black grass. So, I promised I'd get to RNAi, and here it is. So the means by which I'm doing RNAi is actually through virus-mediated transient gene expressions, which is quite a mouthful. And hopefully by the end of this, you'll all understand exactly what I'm talking about. So really what virus-mediated transient gene expression systems are is that you take, good, you take a bit of DNA that you're interested in and you put it into the virus. So these viruses then are the means by which you then deliver that, that, that bit of genetic information. I have to bulk it up into a, a tobacco, so this essentially allows me to make that virus that contains my, my interesting bit of DNA. And so I end up then with an inoculum that, that had, contains my virus. This virus you then put on the plant and you look for phenotypes of interest. So there are two flavors of virus-mediated transient genes expression systems. One is VIGS, so this is virus-induced gene silencing. And all you need to remember is that it's a loss of function. So I'll talk a bit more about the molecular biology in just a second, but compare VIGS against VOX. This is virus-induced overexpression, and this is essentially a gain of function. So these are the two means by which you can test uh, necessity and sufficiency, okay? So in essence, the way that VIGS works, it, so this is virus-induced gene silencing, and so you take your bit of, of DNA and you put it into the plant, into the, uh, the virus, and when the virus infects the plant, it delivers double-stranded RNA. So the double-stranded RNA is really the key to uh, the, the plant's understanding that it's being infected by a virus, okay? So normally when plants are infected by virus, they mount an immune response, and this immune response is mediated by a protein called Dicer, Dicer chops this up in little tiny bits and pieces, which is then recognized by another protein complex. And that protein complex is then directed to degrade the RNA. So basically, when you're talking about the progression from DNA to RNA to protein, what this pathway does is it prevents that, R that mRNA from becoming protein. Okay, so it's a means by which to, to stop the virus from being able to replicate. So what we've done we being a whole bunch of research that I had nothing to do with, I'm just using it in my techniques. Um, but basically what happens here for, uh, for VIGS is that we co-opt this system, we put our own genes of interest into the virus, and then we can use it to target the, the endogenous plant genes, okay? So one of the genes that is targeted quite regularly is this, uh, this protein PDS, which is phytoene desaturase. And the reason why this particular protein is targeted is because Phytoene desaturase is involved in chlorophyll biosynthesis, and it's involved in, in carotenoid biosynthesis. So if you stop this process, you go from a leaf that's really nicely colored and mostly green to a leaf that's white. So targeting of PDS has been done in a variety of different species. Here's a list of the ones that are on there, uh, and they're, they're, but you'll notice none of these are weeds, of course not. But um, there's lots of different plants that have been targeted by VIGS, two of which are barley and wheat. And so if you target PDS in barley and wheat, what you do is you go from a plant that's green to a plant that's white, or a leaf that's green to a leaf that's white. Okay, so it's a very clear, obvious change in what happens in plants. Now remember what I said to you was that basically I want to take everything that I used to be able to do in other species and do it in weeds. So I thought, okay, I'll just give this a go. 
I tried it in Blackgrass, and this is the result. So I'm very excited because hopefully it's clear in the back there, but what you can see is this plant here on the left is nice and green. These are plants that have been targeted with just, just the virus alone with the multiple cloning site, whereas this, these two plants here on the right, you can see that the leaves have gone white. They've gone stripy. They're really nice. So this is a very clear and obvious phenotypic change, and it means that um, the virus itself is leading to a, the, de the degradation of the mRNA that's in, in the plants for the PDS. So if you don't believe me at that level, oh, just to remind you that this is what's happening is so I'm delivering just a piece of the PDS gene, uh, delivering it by the virus into the plant. The virus then delivers double-stranded RNA, which is recognized by the endogenous pathway processes, and then it gets cleaved so the protein doesn't get made. So if you don't believe me at the sort of macro scale, the whole plant scale, here's a picture of just a green leaf, which was great. Uh, making green leaves is a good thing for plants. <laughs> making white leaves is not really a great thing for plants, and so you can understand that this would be a highly regulated process, and it's not something that just kind of happens naturally in the lab. Uh, and this happens with, um, if I use the blackgrass PDS gene or even the wheat PDS gene. So this implies that there's a little level of specificity that's, that's happening, and so you can, you can tailor it back and forth. But I wanted just to show you two different methods. And if I look at the RNA levels of, of the plant, either of the leaf, here it's just cutting down the leaf, or if I take the entire plant and grind it up and take a, a, a measure of the RNA that's in there, you can see that there's a clear and obvious reduction in the amount of RNA that's being produced just by the treatment of um, these plants with the virus. So VIGS works, check, great. So that's my loss of function. What about gain of function? Uh, I said that the VOX is a little bit more straightforward. So what happens with VOX is that you use the protein, you use the virus itself to make the protein. So rather than going through the RNAi response, what happens is you use the, the virus to deliver uh, the, the, the RNA, which then gets translated upon entry and there's co-translational processing and the, you end up with a heterologous protein. So um, plants with white leaves are interesting, they're really good, they're really cool, but glowing plants are even better. So here is my glowing black grass. So um, I have this little picture up here to remind me to tell you that the reason that these plants are red is because you're looking at this through, uh, they've been illuminated with, with a, um, a UV lamp and you're looking at it through, through filters. So here are some plants that have been just infected with the Vox multiple cloning site alone. And what you see over here is everything that's green is actually GFP. So it's important to note that not every, whoops, not every leaf is green and not every cell within the leaf is green. Uh, this is because of the nature of which the virus is infecting. It's something that's just a natural process. Not every, every cell is going to be infected, but, but you can see some very clear, obvious glowing, glowing leaves. So this is great. Now Vox works as well. Just to remind you, the way in which this is happening is that the virus itself is delivering the heterologous protein. It's delivering it in an RNA mechanism, and you end up with the protein being made inside of the plant cell. Looking at it very closely, the nice thing about this is that there, this, the, the, plant, the plants otherwise look obviously healthy. Uh, it's not like they're, they're infected and they're horrible, because looking at uh, um, uh, things like herbicide treatment on plants that are otherwise infected and unhealthy would be hard. These leaves are really nice and healthy, it's just that they're glowing, which is great. Again, not every cell and every leaf is glowing, and it's really obvious when you look at it under the microscope. And it's also obvious when you look at it at the molecular level. So here's a series of Western blots. Uh, so this is total protein, total protein, specific uh, blotting against the anti-GFP, and you can see that, that it's definitely GFP and it's definitely specific. So even at the molecular level, again, I'm verifying that this is the correct changes in the correct directions. So now that I have these technologies, what can I do with them? So I wanted to ask whether or not I could use Vox to confer herbicide resistance to black grass. Now, I know I spent the first half of my talk convincing you that this was a horrible plant because it had all of this multiple herbicide resistance, and here I go trying to make it more herbicide resistant but what I'm trying to figure out is, can I do this? Is it possible? Can I understand what processes are at play? And can I understand if I do this, what's the physical consequence? So if I have an environmental input, what's the devel developmental output? And as a, as a previous life in a genetics lab, um, basically the only herbicide that I knew was actually this herbicide. So this was back in 1987. There was a paper that came out about the characterization of an herbicide resistance gene, BAR, 
uh, from this particular bacteria. And what this bacteria does is it takes, uh, it takes the herbicide and it treats it with acetyl-CoA and, and makes it safe, essentially. So this, this particular um, um, streptomyces can live on, on herbicide. So the way that that works is this herbicide is actually uh, glufosinate, and it's one of the class H herbicides. And, um, and basically what glufosinate normally does is it prevents glutamate to glutamine synthesis, and so it kills the plant by interrupting chlorophyll um, the, the process of uh, making glutamine in the plant. So if you are a plant or a bacteria that has the bar resistance gene, you can survive BASTA or, or, or glufosinate. Um, so the first question was, I told you that, that um, blackgrass is, is very fantastic at surviving herbicides, and it actually is good at surviving glufosinate as well. So wheat dies about here, uh, and you can see that there's differences between the resistant biotype and the sensitive biotype, but if you pick a dose that's high enough, everything dies. And I made a construct that contained the BASTA resistance gene to try and figure out what happened if I infected plants with this BASTA resistance gene. And here is my fantastic picture. I, I actually did a little dance around the lab as soon as I pulled these pictures out. It was great because uh, without statistics, you can see that these are dead and that one's alive, which is great. This is the type of statistics that I like. Um, so basically, if you treat the plants with just the multiple cloning site alone, or if you treat it with the GFP, these were actually the glowing pictures that I showed you in the previous slides, um, they die when you spray them with glyphosinate. Whereas the plants that have been treated with BASTA, with the BASTA resistance gene, they can survive this treatment. If you don't believe me that these were just really good pictures, uh, here's some data that backs that up. So these are fresh weights for um, either the resistant biotype or the sensitive biotype treated with multiple cloning site only, GFP or BASTA, uh, and the ones that were unsprayed. And you can see that, yes, the statistics back this up. So uh, these ones are dead, those ones are living. Now, the reason that I kept banging on earlier about the not every leaf and not every cell in every leaf being infected was because of these differences here. So there's very clear differences between the ones that have been unsprayed versus those that were treated with BASTA, and it's because some of the leaves will be killed by the herbicide. But hopefully, even with that sort of a difference, what you can see is that, that, that treatment with the, the Vox BASTA resistance is sufficient to confer herbicide resistance. Okay. So now I've made super multiple herbicide resistant plants. These are under highly contained conditions. Don't worry, uh, I'm not releasing this anywhere. They're all been autoclaved. Um, but it's a really interesting uh, sort of laboratory hypo uh, hypothesis. Can I confer it? And yes, I can, okay? So that one protein, obviously this is my favorite protein. And, and can I reverse herbicide resistance, right? So, Conferring herbicide resistance won't help anybody anywhere. But if I could take and reverse non-target non site herbicide resistance, that would be a fantastic feat. So what I did was I went back to this protein, which is high in the ones that have non-target site resistance and low in the ones that are sensitive, and I asked whether or not I could use VIGS to reverse this. So essentially what I did was I targeted this protein and I, and using the virus-induced gene silencing. And here are the pictures. So these are plants that, uh, sorry, these are the, the resistant biotype on the top, the sensitive biotype on the top, on the bottom, uh, multiple cloning site alone, and then two different um, t ways to target the AMG STF1. So what is hopefully clear is that the ones that have been target targeted with this A piece of the AMG STF1 are dying. So the one that was resistant initially now looks like the one that was sensitive initially. And again, this is a little bit easier with the numbers. So here's the resistant biotype, and you can see that if you spray it, it doesn't really change compared to the unsprayed. But this one treatment then reverses the, the, the multiple herbis, uh, sorry, the um, non-target site resistance in this plant. So this is very exciting because it, it enables us to say that yes, it's sufficient to reduce herbicide resistance. So by changing one protein, you can, you can, you can alter the phenotype backwards and forwards. Okay. So, Vox, tick, Vigs, tick. And really what this is allowing me to do is then ask questions. So I now have a means by which to ask, is a gene necessary or is a gene sufficient? To, and, and I have measurable outcomes that can alter whether or not the, the plant is surviving and how it's doing. Okay, so I wanted to put this slide in as a, as a quick reminder and perhaps a, a, a little bit of a, a stall in that Vigs and Vox really were 
were developed to address specific questions in the laboratory about crop species. And, the, and um, the, just to remind you that uh, I showed you data in the initial bit of this about wheat and barley, and blackgrass grows where there is wheat. So it's you know, not a, really this is a laboratory type of, of process, and it's a hypothesis-led led questioning rather than something that is um, ready to go out in the field and be sprayed on. But it allows me to ask questions that have never been asked before. And the types of questions that can be asked are really, as, as, um, as big as your imagination is, there's the number of questions that could be asked. Because remember, in the beginning, I wanted to ask a, how to, a molecular level understanding of how black grass is surviving its environment. And what are the molecular responses that are allowing it to survive in, in the environment? And now what I can do is I can look at all of these genes, and I can put them in in Vox and say, are they sufficient? I can look at all of these genes and ask, are they necessary? But we've got the entire genome to query, and we have all of the literature as well. So there's a huge number of questions now that can be asked uh, with enough time, enough patience, and enough man hours in the laboratory. But really, we can start to, to ask these questions and get a molecular level understanding of what has enabled blackgrass to survive. At this point, it just, I want to kind of sum this up. Uh, I hope I haven't gone too fast. I'd be happy to answer any questions afterward, but I just wanted to give you a general overview of what I've told you today. In that, uh, I've introduced you, maybe none of you have heard about blackgrass before, but hopefully I've convinced you that it's a, a serious problem in the Western European agroecosystems, and it's able to thrive there where it seriously impacts yields. I've talked to you a little bit about the Blackgrass uh, Resistance Initiative and the data that, that was developed as, as part of that collaboration. Uh, and among the various things that it, it's enabled us to understand is really a measure of the prevalence and persistence of blackgrass in the UK. It's also given us a very good understanding of the level of target site resistance and non-target site resistance in these fields. And it's very, to me, it's very clearly indicated that we don't know everything. It's not completely non-target site resistance. It's not completely target site resistance. And what we do know isn't sufficient to explain what's actually going on. So there is more research that needs to be done. Uh, it's also given us a huge amount of genetic resources from sites across England. So each of those fields is its own little experiment. And because we have the data that, that goes back uh, 10, 15 years even in some cases, we understand how the, the changes in uh, the agronomy and the changes in, in the crop rotations and that sort of thing have led to the different the different outcomes that have happened. So we can start to query those and start to understand the epidemiology of, of blackgrass as well. But really, my aim, and my aim independent, uh, is trying to, un uh, to take unbiased approaches to um, identify new genes that are underpinning blackgrass's enhanced weediness. So why is it such a good weed, uh, from my viewpoint, not from the farmer's viewpoint? So, and also, I've been trying to develop new experimental resources that allow us to do functional validation of genes in the, in the lab. And, and hopefully, I think the most exciting thing is this development of the transient expression systems, which really offers a step change in our ability to do molecular genetics and functional genetics in blackgrass itself. So um, at this point, I just want to thank everybody that I've been working with. It's been a fantastic move to Rothamsted, and I've been able to work with some really fantastic people, some of whom are listed here. Uh, I'm really excited about the ability to, to get to the blackgrass genome. Uh, this has been a huge collaboration between Bear and Clemson, uh, some of the names are here. I showed you some of the transcriptomics, which was done in collaboration with uh, a company uh, called BGI, and my contact there is Suki Zhang. Uh, the data that I showed initially was from the Blackgrass Research Initiative, uh, which was, again, a huge collaboration of people. I only came in the very end of that project, so I had very little input into it, but it was a huge amount of work and a huge amount of data that then we can continue to query for years to come. My funding is from the BBSRC, and I'm part of the Industrial Start Strategy Challenge Fund, which is the Smart Crop Protection, under the lead of Paul Neve. Uh, and that's where much of my uh, creative license has been able to be funded by that. I wanted to put this back up because I thought it would spark some discussion, uh, and, and hopefully just to remind you of the things that I've told you about today. If nothing else, hopefully you've learned about a new weed that um, is, I think, a, very, a really cunning weed and uh, has driven me to ask a lot of questions that I never thought I'd been able to ask before. But at that point, I think I'll stop here. Objects are very interesting.
But, uh, I have a question for Dr. Dana. Uh, I would like to, to know um, how can the VIX technology be applied in the field if it can be used as a sprayable product? And uh, also, I would like to, to ask some considerations of uh, specific, specificity of the virus to uh, engineer and to use it as a, a VIX vector. And uh, if this uh, virus can be pathogenic to the, uh, to the crop. Right. Um, that's the... The big question really is, now what? Um, most of the work that I do is very much in the lab. Does it work? Uh, and before we can think about how would it work out in the field, there's, there's a number of questions that need to be answered first. Um, as I showed you, the, the virus that I'm using is working in wheat and in barley. So how do you make it specific so that it only deals with the weed? So fortunately with VIGS, it, the specificity comes at the RNAi level, right? So there's, you can choose your RNA target so that it's either specific only to the weed or to more, you know, grasses in general, that sort of thing. And you can also target just a specific gene or a family of genes. Uh, and the way that that's working is by choosing your RNA target very carefully. Um, in order to do that, we need to have the genome. We need to know how different it is at the genetic level from these other species first. Uh, so that's in terms of the application um, and, and working backwards in your questioning. Then to go out and use it in the field, um, there's a whole mountain of questions that need to be asked first. Would it work? Would people accept it? Would it be regulated? You know, would it be a genetically modified organism? Would it not? Um, so we're definitely genetically modifying the virus in order to put this chunk of a, 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 you know, the plant genome into the virus. Um, is the fact that the virus is then infecting, so there's lots and lots and lots of regulatory hurdles, there's ethical hurdles, but there's also a huge number of technical hurdles as well. Um, how do you choose the sequence? Which sequence do you choose? So um, in some ways this is a bit job security. <laughs> um, there's lots left to do, and there's lots left to do in the lab before we can think about making it work. But the nice thing about the system is that it allows us to ask, does this gene do the thing that we think it does. So regardless of whether or not you use VIGS to actually make that change in the field, we can talk about the genetic function of that protein. So uh, we can go away and we can make a spray that acts on that protein. Rather, So use chemistry, traditional chemistry, to target that protein now that we know that it's essential or necessary or sufficient. So really, um, it informs us for how to go forward, but in terms of using it tomorrow, you know, that, there's a lot to do before we could get, get to that point. Uh, a question is for Dan. Um, it's about you talk about of broad resistance or gain resistance using techniques, RNA techniques, RNA techniques. But the question is about what do you think that using RNA techniques like RNA of interference to use like an herbicide, silencing essential genes in the plants. And the other question is to Professor Nepomuceno, that is about of the, the, the presentation was about transgenic crops and using CRISPR and something like that. But what do you think to manage with, with CRISPR? Because I rem remember um, art, an article from Paul Nip that she showed the possibilities to which management with CRISPR but the conclusion in the article is that it's in a long future, and is la uh, today is more about to, to studying using models, mathematical models, but not using in which manner. I mean, today, what do you what do you think? Um, to answer your question about how would I use RNAi to treat the weeds. Um, so the hardest thing about, we know what happens with the, with the, 
the silencing pathway, so we know how post-translational silencing works. The problem is getting that RNA in, into the plant in the first place. Um, so there's been some really nice work done in targeting insects where you spray double-stranded RNA on top of the leaf and then the insect eats that leaf, consumes the RNAi, and that leads to the response. Um, if I could get weeds to eat crops, that would be great. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, the, the delivery mechanism for getting that RNAi response to be initiated is very challenging. Um, so having something like a, a traditional genetically modified organism that's initially starting that process would work. Um, I've chosen to use the virus to be the means by which that process is started. So I think, um, yes, it's, it's, a, it's something that would be lovely to be able to use, but I think for me, it's, um, you know, the application out in the field is, is way far away from what I'm comfortable talking about. I'm not sure I understand that the CRISPR part of your question. Can you repeat in Portuguese? Or... É, bom, é, de palestra, a, a palestra foi mais um, pensando nos transgênicos, usando o CRISPR, ba, é, mais pensando no en el, en el cultivo, nas culturas. Eu, eu li um artigo pensando en usar CRISPR para fazer manejo de plantas daninhas, manejo. Mas aquele artigo concluía que por agora era um sonho, que era mais para estudar com modelos matemáticos, coisas assim, mas que para aplicar no manejo de plantas daninhas, não pensando na cultura, sino pensando na planta daninha, era um sonho, mas eu queria escutar sua opinião. I did I heard about this article, I didn't read that. Uh, I don't know if there is many, but there is some ideas of using CRISPR to turn off some uh, enzymes that have resistance of some herbicides. It's like uh, the same strategy Monsanto was using with Amaranthus palmer, where they want to use uh, the glyphosate together with the RNI to turn off the APSPS in the Amaranthus palmer that is resistant to glyphosate. Uh, the idea that I heard, I'm sorry I didn't read the paper, that's to use CRISPRs, but it was an in vitro study. Uh, to do that in the field, <laughs> the bottlenecks, it would be the same to use RNI to penetrate in the cell. So I don't know if it's going to work. It's, uh, I think it's an experimental idea. Uh, but again, I didn't read the paper. I just discussed with my colleague. But the idea is similar to use RNI, but instead to use a CRISPR, probably in, in a RNP system, as a ribonuclease system, where you express the CRISPR in vitro, and then you spray or you try to introduce inside of the cell. I need to read that paper. Sorry. More questions? While the audience think about the question, I have a question for Dr. Fajard. And before this event, I read some papers to understand more about uh, nano-encapsulation. And uh, I'm very curious because why the chitosan is very used for nano-encapsulation? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, at first it's necessary to think about money. So, chitosan is a very cheap polysaccharide. You can buy one ton from China for $25. It's too cheap. But you have some difficulty to obtain a chitosan with a good quality. Because chitosan is synthesized from chitin. So, you need to deprotonize, uh, demineralize. So Sometimes to obtain a pure chitosan is so difficult. But uh, today you can find a, a lot of cheaper polysaccharides, even uh, working with starch and cellulose, alginate, pectin. So there, there is a, a wide range of opportunities to, to work with this kind of polysaccharides. More questions? I have a lot of questions. I like Dr. Nepunseno. I will 
stay asking a lot of time. Well, uh, I have one more question for Dr. Fajardo. Is about the in this state we have a, great, a big discussion about um, auxinic, auxinic herbicides, about the drift, the volatility, and do you believe that that is possible use the nano encapsulation to reduce this problem in these states? To reduce the, the drift, the volatility of this kind of uh, herbicides? Uh, it's uh, a very nice question because uh, here in Rio Grande do Sul, uh, there is a, a lot of agriculture. Uh, so I think that nanotechnology uh, can, can be used as an efficient tool to, to uh, overcome this, this problem. But uh, it's necessary to think about the, the cause, cause and consequence because the encapsulation can change uh, several properties of the herbicide. So, as mentioned in my presentation, a, a very dedicated uh, study must be done before, because as I talked with uh, Professor Donna, it's, it's difficult to change the result from lab scale to practice, to practice. So, it's possible. It's efficient. What the, the side effects, I don't know.